Welcome, everybody, to uh, Thursday Live on Wednesday. Thank you for tuning in on a Wednesday. Um, I'll explain later why it's Wednesday. Um, this week, I wanted to treat a winter scene, and I wanted to cover three th three things. Uh, one is the balance of warms and cools. Hi, Carol. Uh, in, a, in a painting, um, doing that for effect. Uh, triad palettes. Hi, Shelly. Um, and then, you know, a red, yellow, blue to get your, your mixes and, and just working with a, that small, limited palette. Um, and then how to draw without a pencil which might sound rather scary, but, you know, for some things it's not, and it gives a very freeing sort of effect. So uh, let's start with the triad palettes. Uh, one of the things that I love about winter is that it kind of goes into a red, yellow, blue thing, uh, with one of those colors being sort of dominant and the other two being subdominant. Um, in this instance, uh, the, the one I posted, uh, you can see there's a lot of blue here and a little bit of the, uh, well, the brownish colors are basically going to be made up of reds, yellows, and some blue. Uh, let's have a look at some other examples. Um, by the way, I think I would like to use the composition here. Uh, there used to be a lovely branch coming off of this <laughs> Poor tree. Um, but during the first snow, uh, when it was wet and heavy, that got snapped off. And uh, this is the early morning, and a neighbor helped me push it over there. <laughs> so I've got next year's heat. Here's later in the afternoon, the same scene. You can see we've got some yellows, and we've got some aquas, and we've got some, even some yellow oranges and things. Lucy, someone new, hello. How are you doing? Um, still a lot of blue. The blue is predominating. We've got some yellows and oranges in there, but it, it's lovely, moody kind of thing in the morning there. Um, here's later in the afternoon where we've got some oranges and some crimsons. And boy, I, you know, I really do like that. Uh, uh, it lasts only for a moment, but I do like that when it hits the trees and makes them a little bit ruddier and picks up on the snow and gets some pinks in there. And that, I mean, this as is, that, that could almost be a painting in itself, you know, with the right kind of bird in there, maybe. I don't know. Um, uh, here's a, a, another early morning one with some, uh, let me put this up so you can see a little better there. There we go. Jan, hello. Kimberly, hello. Um, here's more of a morning yellow oranges and, and all these little things there. Um, here's looking back the other direction uh, towards my house and, and all ruddy oranges. And, and it's, I think this is probably, I stood here and then I turned around and saw that. Um, uh, just the, the, the whites are kind of yellowish. And again, we have a, a, a very blue predominant, some yellow starting to show itself, but the reds, so to speak, are kind of subdued. Hi, Becky. Um, this, oh, I love this. It looks like there's some sort of bugs or something crawling under the carpet to get to that. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, look at this. It's a perfect Z. Uh, just winter time is this lovely. It's you. You have this kind of low chroma palette, or not low chroma. You have a triad palette, which can be either high chroma or vivid colors like this, or it could be a little more low chroma like that. So let's just try out a few of these mixes. So. This is, I'm going to put this sideways so you can see it better. I may have shown folks this before, but 
uh, probably a lot of you have not seen this. You're probably all familiar with color wheels. And uh, the circular one, I don't think, it's theoretically it's correct, but it is not as far as mixing goes. It doesn't work the way pigments work. So, for example, with the circular color wheel, uh, if you go directly across, you don't actually get to that neutral color. Um, with many of the mixes, and you don't actually get to the, the predicted color that you might want. I think for mixing purposes, hi, Judy, it comes out to be more of an egg or a guitar pick sort of shape. Um, and the thing I'm trying to show here is that uh, if you do try to mix straight across the circular color wheel, one of them will work, the red to the green. Not perfectly, but if you have a bluish green like phthalo green and you have a bluish red violet like quinacridone magenta, you can get a perfect neutral color. Uh, and in fact, the neutral tint by M. Graham is made of phthalo green and quinacridone magenta. So I've put a few of my usual colors on here. The alizarin crimson is a little bit less vibrant than the quinacridone magenta. So as you know, around the perimeter of the color wheel, the color is the most vibrant it can be. And then as you move in to the uh, towards the center of the color wheel, they become less vibrant. So a yellow ochre is a less oops a less vibrant version of a yellow orange or a cad yellow medium. A burnt sienna is a very low, less vivid, very low chroma version of a red orange. So what I'm trying to show here is that uh, if you draw a straight line from one color to another color, uh, you get from one end of the thing to the other when it's an egg, not a s circle. You can get that color. So you can see here going from ultramarine blue to get burnt sienna. I would have to be somewhere between cad red light and cad orange. So let's let's demo that. Um, get a little bit of ultramarine blue. Well, that's probably too much because we don't need as much blue as we need red and orange. We'll get some cad red light and some cad orange, maybe a little more of the red, mm, and maybe a little more of the blue, maybe a little more of the red. So we will get something that looks like burnt sienna. Let's uh, A-B that with a, well, this isn't burnt sienna, this is quinacridone magenta, which is a little more orangey. So let's say we put into this mix that we just made a little more orange. We would get something that looks pretty close to it, maybe a little more red in it. So I think this is a bit more, uh, hi Leah, I'm hoping that this is a little bit more correct in terms of mixing. Okay, so let's say yellow ochre. Um, to get yellow ochre, we need something that is, uh, would be between a, a medium yellow like that, and an orange. and a tiny bit of ultramarine blue. And you can see we get something very much like yellow ochre. Let's A-B that with some real yellow ochre. Now, of course, everybody's yellow ochres. So this is duller. We need a little bit more of the red and the blue, so we'll take it from here. 
everybody's yellow ochre is a little more, that yellow ochre could be big. Vicky, hello. Um, and that burnt sienna could be big because everybody's a little bit different. So it might be this more this way, might be more that way. Um, quinacridone gold would probably be somewhere up here. Um, the quinacridone sienna would be somewhere probably in here. So, but I, hopefully this gets the idea across. You could, with a, a low chroma palette, produce, um, well, let's do another one. Uh, Prussian blue, we need something between red and orange. So let's get a wee bit of Prussian blue. Okay, oh, I guess you can't see that down here. I have moved my uh, palette, which I will show you what I'm doing there in a little bit. So we're going to need a lot of orange and a lot of cad red. More of the red. Maybe a little more of the blue. Gee whiz. More of the red. Oops. So we're getting a, let's put some more red in it. So this mixing strategy, I think, works a little better than the circ the perfect circle, which is just theoretical. Um, to make this absolutely perfect, I think there might be a need to be like a bit of a salient going in at this area. I don't know. Anyway, hopefully it gets the idea across. But you're probably thinking, well, John, why in the heck would I buy two expensive colors, three expensive colors, just so I could mix yellow ochre, which is one cheap color. Well, the answer is no, you shouldn't. <laughs> Get the yellow ochre. But um, you could, if you wanted, you could use three high chroma, like say, ultramarine or your Prussian or even a phthalo blue, and like alizarin, which would be a very high chroma, clear, transparent red, and a, a yellow, oops, sorry about the earthquake there, and you could come up with a very transparent looking version uh, if you didn't want the more dense colors like yellow ochre or burnt sienna, which tend to have a little more body to them. So, got that. Or you could go in a more low chroma. Uh, this is by a, a, a believe he's Polish painter. His name is Michael Jesowitz. Um, this looks like maybe cobalt blue, burnt sienna, possibly some cobalt turquoise, and possibly a little bit of some reddish alizarin. But you can see just balancing his warms and cools, it's mostly cool colors the neutrals of the white, and that little bit of brownish colors over there, just uh, looking delicious. One side of this warm, one side of that cool. It's just really uh, uh, spectacular. I like that. So I want to use kind of this composition. Maybe that color. Ooh. Golly, I kind of like that. Kind of like that. Jean, hello. So I think I use this coloration with this composition. So I need to look at the colors I'm going to mix up. Um, what I've done, hello, Lisa. Uh, I've put this, made this cardboard gizmo to put on my table. So that gives you an idea of the angle of the table, which probably looks flat to you. And then the palette is now flat. So what I'm hoping to do is, let's see. Uh, 
Yeah, but I'm gonna have to be. <laughs> okay. It's a, okay, this will work, okay. So when I tip this up, yeah, it'll be very runny, but the slow moving ones are going to be down here. Hi, Leslie, how are you? Um, so just, I don't know, maybe this will work, maybe it won't work, we'll see. Um, just to throw in a, a wrinkle, you could, if you wanted to have little small light things, you could use the white china marking pencil to do a resist for things like that. With this sort of coloration, I'm going to want pinks, so that's all right. So to plan it, how am I going to do it? Well, I think I'm going to put in a wash of yellow ochre, let it run down to about there, followed by a wash of pink. followed by a wash blue, and then that will have to be dry. I'll be a little, a lot more, well, because the, the, we're on a slant, the pigment is going to migrate downwards, so it will more of the yellow and the pinks will collect down here than up there. And I may need to turn the board over like that, we'll see, to keep the blues strong up there. Um, the other thing that will do is that because this blue will have a wee, wee bit of yellow and red underneath it, it will be a bit more neutral. Hello, Lynn. And then down here, this blue will be a little bit more vivid. So it'll kind of boom, jump forward. We hope. <laughs> okay. Washes. I want a big brush. Uh, plenty of water. Um, well, doggone it, I'll just make the puddles up here. Um, I had a thought about talking about, you know, I talked about there being basically two mixtures of paint, runny and slow moving. And within runny, if you tilt it and it runs quickly and makes a puddle, very readily, um, then you're going to get a very, very pale tint. If it runs fairly fast but doesn't make much of a puddle, you're going to get something darker. If it runs slowly, getting lots of yellow ochre here, This is a Daniel Smith yellow ochre. It's called burgundy yellow ochre or something. Um, it's a little greener and duller. I don't know. They've got about 12 yellow ochres. <laughs> and I, I keep trying all these things, and then eventually I just come back to the, to the M. Graham. Okay, I think that should get me... Well, doggone it. Let's put a little orange in there. Now I also want to rinse that good, blot it, get some clean water, make a uh, alizarin or quinacridone rose, either one. I need to get a lot of water in that. But I, did, I want it a little more powerful because when I put a wash of yellow ochre, the surface will be wet. Therefore, when I go in with the pink, I need to be a little less wet uh, so that, because there's already water there. Um, I sometimes call this a tequila sunrise wash. Um, and I may need, at the bottom, I may need to smuggle in some uh, some orange, because there is an orangey sort of quality to this. It's very, very sweet. 
Okay, so. Oniva, just dive in. Loaded from the side. Lots of uh, pigment. I mean, you load the brush from the side. I need to look at that. I need more already. I need to get stronger. Um, pick up the bead. Need to work quickly, you know, don't I? You see the beads stop or starve out, stop, pick up paint, go back to where you were. As long as there's some water on that, a lot of water on the surface, you can hit it again and you won't have a streak. Now here's where I need to get red. Start getting red into the pinks. Yes, maybe even a little further up. That's about as the latest I can go in on those pinks. More pink. These are gonna fade, so, and we've got some strong darks coming in. These are bluish violets, so it doesn't matter if there's a little bit of bluishness or reddishness underneath. Okay. Let's just peter that out. I just used water there. Gonna wait a hot second. I still wanna see some glisten up here. Now I need to go into my blue, which I guess you can't really see. It's gonna all do it over here. Hopefully you can see that. Ultramarine. Or Cerulean, either one would work. A little slower because there's a lot of water on there, right? Make sure it's mixed good, that there aren't little strings in there. Uh, a lot of water on here, so it's going to migrate. Switching over to a little more water. Don't worry about runs, you can always... So I'm gonna, this is almost gonna be water. Yep, see, it's carrying a little bit of the blue down. Rinse that brush, pure water. Now there's a big bead of red or pinks collecting at the bottom. A little texture won't kill us. So I need to first, well, we're getting a nice bleed there. I need to s squeeze the brush out. Hey, Alan, how are you doing, man? Um, pick that up. And then I'm gonna turn the board upside down. And with luck, some of the red will come back into this area and the blue will gradate dark towards the top, which is what I'm wanting. So let's let that sit a bit. Hmm, some little blanks there. I think I kind of like that. Um, I could speed this up with a hairdryer. I think I'm about where it needs to be. So. Sorry about all that noise. Gee whiz. Okay. 
Okay, now back to the well, 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 gosh, look at those lovely ruddy colors. I'm gonna have to jump back and forth a bit. So, one of the reasons it's really not worth drawing something like this to start with is because you don't know quite where you're gonna get your uh, transition in your colors. So that leaves you an option. I can tell by looking at this, I wish I'd have started the red a little further up and I bet I could, if I'm careful, I could reglaze. With some red. Now what that's going to involve is or this pinkish rose color. Make sure there's no little strings in it. Bit of water. So you can put a little orange in it. Okay, now. What I'll need to do is start with pure water up top. Hello, Frida, how are you? I'm gonna start with water and then right about here, I'm gonna start coming. This is still cool. Maybe I better hit that with a bit more hair dryer. So um, cover your ears because what I'm about to do is a glaze and whenever you do a glaze, you wanna make sure that the surface below is perfectly dry or pretty close to it. So the, the mixes of paint uh, so far are uh, quite runny and a little off runny. So here we go with just, just water. Now the reason I'm doing this is so that the uh, very, very, oh look at that, see I'm lifting, oh darn it, shouldn't have done it. Well, let's do... Oh, John, John, John. All right. Emergency. I'm just getting more pigment. Throwing a little bit of cerulean in there to hopefully mimic. The yellow quality. Now I'm picking up the red, runny red. Trying to come up, catch the bead from underneath. Oh boy. Well, we're going to get a different kind of sky. That's what we're going to get. Let's go to some orange. Oh geez, look at this. It's going to be a surprise sky. Well, there you go. That's why you don't... <laughs> That's why you don't glaze over a almost dry surface. Uh, look at that, jeez, John. The thing is, you know, never stop, never quit. Um, don't, don't throw the towel in. I guarantee you, at some day, if I went back through my photos, I could find something that looks like that. Oops, more earthquakes. I keep bumping my head here. All right, now this definitely has to dry. So I'm sorry about all the uh, 
crazy, crazy hair dryer noise. Grass graves. Adds a little bit of heat to the room with nothing else. <laughs> okay, now let's paint. So, I am going to just, in case I don't need runny colors like that, I'm gonna mop them up, but leave a little bit of that in there because when that mixes in with the other colors when we're going for our neutral darks, um, it's gonna temper them, do a nice thing there, and it's sort of like wine that's been aged on the leaves or something. It'll give it a little character. Um, this composition. So, now we're to the subject of drawing without a pencil and warm, cool balance. I'm gonna try to, oops, um, overall, we're gonna have a lot more blue than we are the reds and the yellows. Once we get some blues in down here, then that's pretty much going to be the situation. We're actually going to, kind of like that, aren't we? Yeah. That's what we're doing. Okay. Um, and so you, as you can see here, there's overall a lot more blue than the yellow and the red. And then there's these neutrals, which are the strong shapes, which are creating the, uh, maybe what you'd call the intermediate thing. Um, it's it's going to be dark, so there's a little bit of ruddiness on this. There, Probably two seconds earlier, there was probably some lovely ruddy colors up in here, So as there are on the very tops of those distant trees. So I think we can, you know, maybe do a T minus whatever and, and smuggle in some of that interest that way. So I'm going to need uh, a a ratty brush and a brush that makes uh, fine lines. So I may use this, uh, uh, it's like a, a, what do you call them, a rigger, but it's got a larger belly so that it holds more pain and you can get out there and do these little things for a while. Um, I'm probably gonna use the Oriental brush because it holds less paint um, and is stiffer and it's good with darker colors, uh, denser paints. So we'll see. So, warm, cool balance. Um, you don't want to have 50 50. That's the thing with the balance. It's, you, don't, you, you want it to be a warm, cool imbalance. Uh, always give either more warm colors, fewer cool colors, or more cool colors for uh, fewer warm colors. So, drawing without a pencil. Just visualize. When you draw with a pencil, you're drawing blind. <laughs> so, the brush and a pencil 
They're long, straight things with a point at the end that you hold down here. Hello, Charles. Um, if you can draw with this, why not draw with this? Um, it's a more expressive thing. You just have to put a little more thought into where am I and how big is the shape. So if we look at this rectangle, we can see that there's more above than there is below. So we know our horizon line is going to be low. I think I'd like to make a lot of that tree. Um, or, you know, maybe I'll do a... <sighs> yeah, yeah, well, uh, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. So here's kind of how I'm going to compose this. Doesn't want to stay like that, does it? Oh, well. Below the halfway mark, a little past the halfway mark. This, this, this. Okay, so what is the distance between, what is the width of this distant trees versus the width of that? This is a tad bit thicker. Um, it, things like that. Okay, so let's come up with, we need a ruddy sienna color. Why, well, I'm not gonna mix it from the, the blue and the yellow and the, and the brown. We're gonna use burnt sienna. <laughs> Why not? We're going to start with that. So these are, if we tipped them, see they run slowly. Whoop, <laughs> that doesn't. Um, let me mop that up. I think I want it a little redder than that actually, so I'll put some of the uh, alizarin or something in it or the alizarin uh, substitute. Uh, now, below the halfway mark, this is darker than that. I'm gonna push the brush a little bit sideways so the upper side, well, there's two ways I could do this. I could pull left to right and then I could use, let's get some red in there. I could use some, let's even dry that. I blotted it. And I'm dragging the brush sideways to get a broken mark. And I even want to get a little more red in there, maybe a little more of this. Uh, while it's damp, I can touch it in and it'll bleed irregularly. Now as it goes to the left, it gets bluer. So I'm going in with some slower, because there's water there. I just brought some paint to it. There's going to be water there. I'm going with a denser mix of paint. So I'm putting in the ultramarine blue. I'm actually just touching it in. Thicker still. Maybe a little bit of red in that. Get a purple. To leave the tops be that sun-kissed um, delicious orangey, ruddy red that we get that time of year. And I'm going to wait a second because the paint is running down to the bottom. Um, and I want to really plow in with a bit of strong violet color. So I'm going to have to wait on that. Now I've got down here uh, and uh, I've got some more brownish. So let's get some sienna. 
off to the side of that. Very slow moving. I'm going to blot the brush a bit. It comes over to about what? A quarter, three quarters here. It's here, there's a little gap in between there. Oh goodness. Let's get more red. More blue. And a little bit of this for a brown. I need to blot that. There's not much paint. We're leaving some shapes up top here to be the snow, which will not actually become apparent. Uh, here's my E911 sign. <laughs> Post. Now, more blue. See, I'm dipping right into the strength of the blue towards the bottom of that. Let's make that actually really purple. Leave some gaps in there. This is pitching a little bit that way. I'm going to pitch this a little bit that way. It's a bunch of wild grapes or uh, bittersweet that's on my fence line. And Gina, hello. Hi, Cindy. Uh, it's just a tangled mess, and I leave it that way because when everybody drives by, it causes the uh, a little bit less dust to come into the house in summer. Okay, now, back here, it's dried up a bit, so I can put a little bit more, let's put some blue into that, to make a more bluish purple. I can touch along the bottom here. And get it to look a bit more distant. Now, okay, I think we're almost there. Now, I've also got, let's rinse that brush, blot it, and get a more brownish purple. And we're going to do the dirt that gets, Richard, hello. Um, where is this? It's not as high as that but it's not as low as that. So I'd somewhere in here. I'm gonna blot again to get as much paint off that brush as I can. And uh, I wish I could get some more off of it. This is the gravel that comes up from the... road when the maintainer goes by. Okay. Can I smuggle in a little more Strong purple? Yeah, let's do that. Blues. Oh, that's very, very purple. Royal purple. But vivid as that is, when it goes in back here with these siennas and other colors, it's going to drop back a bit. So I might even put a little of that in there. We can even, when the glisten goes off, we could pull up a straight, make, uh, you know, something that tree with snow on it, maybe we'll call it. That one I'm going to make purple all the way. 
Okay. Now. I think I have to dry this. Sorry about all this hair dryer. This area to the back, we're going to we're going to negatively paint the snow on top of the fence here by virtue of painting this shape around it. Was I about like that? I think I was. <laughs> so the blue I need is not going to be so purple. I'm going to get some uh, cerulean in there or cobalt turquoise. Yeah, cobalt turquoise. And some water. And I needed that to be dry because I'm going to probably glaze over it here. Okay. And let's make it a wee bit darker at the bottom. Or maybe darker on one side than the other. I might even put a bit more of that in there. It is, yeah, it's very dark back there, surprisingly. Here too. Now behind this, I'm gonna need some straight up turquoise, I think. To get a few of the spots showing through where we see the ditch. Now, a little more of the turquoise into this mix and a wee bit of red, the quinacridone rose, a lizard's crimson substitute. Oh, uh, let's see how we want to do this. I want to skip those things where the light is kissing that. I might let a little bit sneak across here. Let's see what we can get. Do I want to use it? Yeah. I want to use a bigger brush. So, big mop. Not as big as the first mop I used. Low-ish moving paint, a little bit of that. This is that uh, runs quickly but doesn't form much of a puddle consistency. So.
Get a little bluer. Take advantage of any skips you get. This is the side of the, what was shoveled. If you get a skip, take a look at it, see does it look like something I can use? If not, get rid of it while it's wet. Okay, more turquoise. because it's a more vivid blue than the ultramarine and I'm going to just use that to bring this edge forward. Looks like I could use a bit of that in there. Little bits in here. Make it look like crumbled crumbled snow. <laughs> That's not a thing, is it? A little bit back there. A little bit in here. Okay, we're starting to look snowy, yay, yay. Do I dare smuggle that? Don't smuggle that in there yet. Okay. Now I could, at this point, um, take a damp brush, the, the Chinese brush, blot a little bit of water and here and there touch in to make some blossoms to, I'm hoping this will look like the little clumps of snow that got thrown up and put some of those in here too. Bigger ones down at the bottom, closer to us, larger ones further away. There's a bit of, oh yes, there is a bit of shadow there. I think I need to have, I'm just going to go for some burnt sienna in the blue, ultramarine blue. Make that gravelly dark. I need to darken that area, so I'm just touching it into a damp area. Where the snow folds over the top, there will be a darker, shadier bit underneath. So this is dry that I'm applying that to. And that will hopefully make it look a little more like that. Now let's so even throw in some gravel for where I scraped it. I have a gravel driveway, so I when I shovel down to it. Some comes out. Because you can't really see where stuff is. And remember, we can always go back with some tinted white to get our... <laughs> okay. Okay, that's enough of that. Let us dry this mess and then put our tree in. Virginia, hello. You, boy, Virginia is really good at winter scenes. <laughs> And I did not mention, and I should have, 
We have an 11 by 15 piece of uh, Saunders Waterford cold press. So you can see the idea here is I'm just making decisions about where are, where things are and how big they are. So uh, this below the halfway mark, that not too far below it, but three quarters of the way out, uh, that a little bit above this, but there's less space here than there is between there and there. So if you can get those relationships, you will be all right. Um, I'm going to take just a little bit of this and put a thin line there. And the maintainer's scraper blade goes. And then I also want to get some strong blue and touch it right about in there. I really should be doing those as final marks, shouldn't I? So cut it out, John. Okay. Now, our tree. Two of them, actually. I could tell you a fun story about that pair, but I won't today. <laughs> I am going to need ultramarine blue. And we're going for slow moving paint. If I were to tip this up, you can see it's not really going to go anywhere. It sort of stays put. Oops, burnt sienna. One end I'm going to make a little bit more burnt sienna ish. Or this is actually quinacridone or transparent red iron oxide, quinacridone, sienna, they're all this end a little more bluish, but each having a little bit of that in it. Well, you know, it's going to have to be dark. It's going to have to be dark. Rinse lot. I usually get the best. Now, go, okay, where is it going to be? I'm going to, it's right on that same line, but I am going to try to bring it a little bit further forward. It is actually on the other side of that fence, but spatially it'll make more sense if uh, it's out front. I'll have a foreground and close middle ground da, 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 as I work my way back. So, oh, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, John, just make a lot of it or you'll be sorry. You don't want to have to mix too much paint on the fly if you can avoid it. Let's have a lighter, redder version over here when I get to those ready bits on the top. Rinsed it good. Blotted it to get the water out because if I don't blot it, I bring a wet brush to this, it's going to dilute it and it won't be dark enough. So look at that, it's hardly enough. Rehearse your stroke. We can, we, we can revisit this. Look at that, hardly enough paint at all. And I find I get the better result from painting the same way the tree grows. So as long as it's wet, I can work back into it. Now there's a second trunk coming up here. Let's get the redder mix. I'm going to touch, well, let's get some orange even. I'm going to touch that to the 
right sides of these branches, or trunks, because the light is coming from our right. We're looking due east, actually. Uh, while that's wet, rinse it. I'm going to get some flat out cerulean. I think I'll touch the other side. Maybe get a little bit of, oh, if I'm lucky. Uh, how much of that do I want coming over? Look for big intersections. And again, try to, I, and I'm terrible at this, try to remember that it's growing from the trunk out. Don't start out in here. And come back. Uh, this tree is actually quite a tall tree. Redder. While it's wet, you can pop new color in. I'm working off the tip of this thing. And this is where I really want to get into my smaller brush, the crazy one. Rinse it, blot it, get into the dance it. Now, how much do you need? Enough to say tree. You don't need every blight. And I'll tell you, these, well, they're dead trees, actually. They're ashes, um, or near dead. The emerald ash borer got them. And there's nothing you could do about it. So they're going to be heat several years down the road. So where I see density of these kinds of branches... That's where I'm going to be putting that in. I might even get something in between here. It's a number 10 or 12 uh, nylon. To get some... It, it makes quite a point if you don't jam down on it. You can get right on to the point. Try not to space your branches too evenly. You know, make the Christmas tree effect. Um, where do I want density? Where do I want looking about here? I want the intervals between these branches and trunks to be irregular, not evenly spaced. Uh, they need to be, whether or not they actually are, they need to be thicker at the bottom or in towards the trunk and uh, narrower as they go out. So what I'm actually painting this to look like it would be if the thing was healthy and had been left to, uh, who had been pruned rather than just left to whatever will grow that the bug hadn't gotten to. Because it used to provide a wonderful amount of shade and, oh golly. Stop the dust from the road. So I think I'm getting close to where 
I want to not fiddle with it much more. I do need more out here. So I can push this thing on its side and get one in each hand here. And, oh, well, let's, you know, like, I don't like that. I'll blot him. Oops. <laughs> so, trying to create the general effect of a lot of twigs. I'm really being cruel to this brush. Uh, pushing on it. So when you get something that looks like that, make it look like maybe it ought to by bringing in something that would make sense. I'm going to blot him. That's... Get crazy with it. And then let's make it plausible. And this is where you have to be careful that you don't get nuts. Fence posts in there, so make this just a wee bit more plausible. That fella needs to be a little bit more okay. This is where you should stop, not get too nuts. What can we do to make this a little bit neater? We can, I think, put some light glaze of reddishness. Uh, it should be orangey. I need a bit of clean water is what I need. Gee whiz. So, I usually keep two uh, water jars, one for a little cleaner and one for really dirty, but sometimes I mess up and stick it in the wrong. Something pinkish, orangish. Tint the lower portions of that area there. Perhaps even some spots up in here sort of suggest that ruddy light that's getting into the, on the side of the brush and pushing. Nancy, hello. Almost no paint on it. Let's even glaze a little bit of pink or this orchidy color. Quinacridone rose back there. Yeah, I like that. I like that. 
and I can let a little bit of it come over top of what has previously been painted. And because it's lighter, it'll look like it's further away trees. Yeah, that's the thing. Let's have a bit of that. Let's make it a little more orangey. Well, maybe not. Let's keep it that lovely orchidy color. Just a bit more of that there. Bit of that there. Bit of that up here. Just accent colors. Gosh, yeah. It looks like too much. Blot it. Oh, gosh. Let's see, get a bit of that back there. have a little bit of blue in that to make a purple and this bit over here uh, just some these well maybe not that dark let's get some turquoise stuff and I wanted these light spots that I when I touched in to make lighter areas in the darker areas I'm going to put a dark blue to this uh, one side of it to help look like those little loose clumps of snow so hopefully they'll look like that and not like splatter <laughs> let's have a bit of that yeah let's just get some turquoise underneath this now just like oddly enough you know the red is supposedly a, a warm color that advances blue is supposedly a cool color that recedes that is overridden or by vividness, chroma, saturation, intensity. A so-called warm color that is not vivid will drop back. If you have a so-called cool color that is vivid, it will jump forward. So saturation or vividness trumps chroma, uh, the so-called warm and cool. So I'm gonna, woo, glaze parts of this tree Particularly that one. And let's see what we got. Well, maybe I need a couple more little yucky gravelly bits down here. And the other thing I need, so I'm going to get some really dense lavender and some turquoise, which are both naturally opaque colors. And there's my E911 sign in shadow. Could also use that for bits of snow, couldn't you? Oh, yeah. Dry brush it on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Love lavender. Oh, what a good color. Okay, let's detape and see what we've created. driveway <laughs> okay so I'm looking at it yeah I've got a nice gradation going here I've got uh a triad, a blue, 
yellow, very little yellow in this, just the yellow ochre there. But um, maybe I could throw, maybe I could throw in a branch or two. You do want to make sure that the intervals between things is irregular. So that it's not that sort of Christmas tree thing. Hi, Doug. Thank you, Carol. Um, so that's, uh, hopefully th that idea came across. Working with a triad, you can mix from a high chroma triad, uh, the cad yellow light. Um, this mixing wheel idea that that circular thing doesn't quite, it's theoretically it's correct, but um, in terms of how pigments actually mix, it doesn't work. <laughs> so um, I, I will happily send this to, to anyone who wants it. Just let me know. Uh, but the idea of using a triad is because in winter, it is so much actually the red, yellow, and blue are almost, uh, summer is almost green, orange, and purple, isn't it? Uh, but then the other thing is the keeping the balance of the colors more of the warm colors or more of the cool colors, but not equal amounts of both. So, uh, and also your values, keep your darks, more darks than lights or more lights than darks. Um, and that'll always look a little more natural. Um, when you're painting, drawing with a brush, as opposed to drawing with a pencil, the decision-making process is exactly the same. Oh, thank you, Virginia. Um, you have to decide where is it going to be and how big is it. And if you make that decision, uh, you can do it with a brush just as well as you can do it with a pencil. And then it will have a fresh look because it won't be a pencil line outline that you filled in after the fact coloring book style. Now, obviously, something like that is going to be good for landscapes and natural irregular forms. If you're getting into uh, architecture, then you're going to need to do probably a little drawing. If you've got automobiles or people or whatever, it's going to need some drawing. But uh, I'm trying to get used to painting more with the brush so that I can kind of speed up the process of working on location uh, where I'm not having to spend time doing too much drawing and then going into painting. I just want to do it uh, as is. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Um, so hopefully that was fun. Um, thank you for tuning in on a Wednesday. Uh, the reason is uh, the, the art supply store in Fairfield, I'm going to be holding down the fort there tomorrow because the, the owner and the, and the regular help have other things that they, emergencies they're involved in. So, um, yeah, if you're in Fairfield and you want to drop by and just, you know, talk or something, I'll be there from, uh, I think, noon to four or five, something like that. So thank you all for tuning in. I uh, hope you're staying warm. It's been crazy cold, hasn't it? And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Oh, and thank you, Wayne. Bye-bye.